Greetings, everybody. I'm Larry Williams, the director of Karma, the Consortium for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis. Uh, it is September 21st, 2022, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to another version of Karma Quick Chat, uh, where we take the opportunity to catch up with people who are engaging with Karma in one of several different possible ways. Uh, and today it's a real pleasure to be having the opportunity to connect again with John Matthew. John is a Board of Trustees, Distinguished Professor of Management, and the Friar Chair in Leadership and Teams at the University of Connecticut. And we are chatting with him today because in a few weeks, on October the 7th at noon Eastern time, he will be giving another Karma webcast. Uh, I say that because John has given of his time uh, to Karma before. So, John, it's really good to see you. We're grateful for your lecture and grateful that you're going to take the time to catch up with us. So uh, it's a real treat of uh, the work that I do to have the opportunity to meet so many great accomplished people like yourself. And I'm always uh, interested in uh, basically how people got to where we're at, because I think there's so many people that, uh, particularly the junior people that think that people who end up being successful, that that's always, they knew that's what they wanted to do. And it was clear from the beginning. So how did you end up in this professor? Um, thanks, Larry. First, I just want to say, thanks for having me. I think Karma is a wonderful uh, institution. I think you guys do great things and I'm, I'm happy to participate in it. Um, in terms of getting into the profession, that's that's an interesting one. I, uh, I went to college as much because I didn't have anything else to do. I think I wanted to keep playing some sports and not leave the area. Um, so I was a very mediocre student. Uh, and I hit about my sophomore year, I took a course in social psychology. And it really, it, sudden, it got it. It suddenly snapped into place. And I, and I really resonated with that. And they had a TA, a guy named Steve Nadell, who was their graduate assistant, who invited me to work with him. So I ended up doing work with him on crowding research for a couple of years. Um, if you know your trivia, Steve Nadell was actually the, the driving force behind the Baron and Kenny um, article ah. in terms of mediation and moderation. So I was ah. actually the undergraduate who was running uh, subjects. And, you know, I went off to graduate school um, thinking everybody knew mediation and moderation all about Baron and Kenny. Um, but uh, anyway, so I was hooked on social psychology, took a course on IO psych and realized that, hey, this is social psych in the business world. And there are great opportunities out there. So I went into graduate school at Old Dominion in IO Psych, fully intending to go um, into the practice world. Um, mm -hmm. But I got I got the bug and I found research interesting. And uh, I can't say it was a direct route. It was very much a, a, um, a curvy route. And, uh, you know, coming out, I got a great opportunity to join Penn State and their IO faculty. And that's sort of where things launched. Yeah. And was it tough making the transition from a psych department to a business school? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say it was, but mine was a little bit of a more unique kind of transition. One, I did it later in career. So I was a full professor at, at Penn State and I had been uh -huh. collaborating and branching out with a, a, a number of people over in the management department. And um, at UConn, they allowed me to sort of really uh, try to drive the PhD program. Um, so it was uh, much of the same. I did get some new audiences in terms of applied master's programs, MBAs, and so forth. Um, so uh, it's interesting. In, in management, you have to kind of be split brain. You've got to be a true academic when you're doing research and talking with PhD students, but then you need to pivot and be a real practitioner and have real world guidance when you're talking to MBAs. In contrast, in IO, you're kind of always on the slash. Everything that you're doing is this mix of scientist practitioner. So you got to have to span the field in both places, but in different ways. Yeah. Well, um, you've been obviously very successful at what you've been doing. And I find that people over their careers, what they do kind of evolves and changes. And there's some good things about that and some bad things about that. What do you enjoy doing the most these days in terms of your academic <laughs> responsibilities? Uh, yeah, you, that's a great question. Um, you know, and as I, I reflect on, you know, what's brought me joy and what have I done throughout my career, there is, there is a common theme and that is usually doing things that matter. It's not always applied research, but it's always got a line of sight 
for things that matter. Um, you know, that could be matter from an academic in sense in terms of advancing theory on something. Um, but mostly I, I, I stay in the world of, you know, is this going to matter to somebody in the real world? Is it going to make things more efficient? Is it going to make people more engaged, happier? Is it going to reduce some accidents, things of that sort? So a lot of my work has been uh, a blend with practitioners or applied kinds of settings. Um, and I typically do that in a, in a small team with PhD students. So um, I, I certainly enjoy mentoring people along the way and getting them involved and watching them grow and then go out uh, and contribute to our field in a whole variety of different ways. Yeah. Um, John, one of the things, uh, so I, I uh, suggested uh, that I'd like to throw in a couple of extra questions to you. One of them was not the one that I submitted, but I can't resist. <laughs> and so when we were chatting before we started recording, you kind of shared your perspective of your career in terms of being involved with a mixture kind of different areas and methods. Um, and, I, and I guess we'll maybe see more of that reflected in your webcast. But in general, you know, we tend to specialize so much. So how would you say that you have benefited or how do you see your research and your theory and your thinking uh, impacted by having a little bit of everything kind of like you were describing in your background? Um. Well, thanks. I, I'm, I'm kind of a bricolage scholar in the sense of I'll use different things in different instances. Part of that, uh, candidly, is a curiosity. Um, part of that is the deeper you get uh, involved in any particular technique, whether it's structural equation modeling, whether it's qualitative research, whether it's experimental research, you start to realize the blind spots in there. And I think that's important for scholars to understand what a lab study can tell you and what it can't, what a field study is able to say and not so that uh, these days, I, I oftentimes start with what I consider to be an important question. It more often than not emanates from something out in the field uh, that we've seen, and then start asking questions about how is it that we can best understand this thing? And that's oftentimes in different venues and in different ways. So uh, my talk that I'll do in a couple of weeks, will talk about mixing and matching methods for purpose. So depending on the, the, the nature of the research question you have, how, how evolved is that particular domain of knowledge? Uh, what are your unique kind of insights? Uh, I'm gonna argue you come at it from different directions. Uh, and that's not just a platitude that you should always use multiple or mixed methods, uh, but that there are, are certain alignments. So that's what I'm going to be getting into is really talking about the alignments of the whole research process. We tend to teach things in isolation. Here's how you do sampling. Here's you know, experimental design. Here's field design. Here's measurement. Uh, but I, I think that in order to understand something, you really need to look at an integrative whole of how all the pieces hold together. Yeah, that's it's, it's great. Well, it's uh, obviously served you uh, served you well. One of the areas uh, that you have probably been most closely identified with and worked the most with concerns teams and basically the study of phenomena at different levels of analysis. And you've kind of got a perspective where you've seen that evolve, you know, over the past thirty years. So. I mean, gosh, when you think about those early days like of Meso and the people that were just starting to advocate that, now you've got, you know, we offer three short courses on multi-level analysis. And so as you look at that, do you think we're doing a good job with understanding multi-level issues? Are there are there things that we've done well, we as the community, things that we're not doing so well? You've got a great view on that. What what comes to mind? You know, oh, oh, thanks, Larry. Uh, uh, benefit of being a seasoned veteran, not old, seasoned veteran <laughs> in the field. Um, you know, there, there was a moment when I was studying for comps where I actually got an advanced preview of Denise Rousseau's research and organizational behavior chapter. That's her 85 chapter. Uh -huh. 
you know, her work and some of the work that Fran Yamarino and others were doing with Carlene Roberts and Hewn and Roussel really was the genesis of that whole multi-level um, phenomenon. And I was at that ripe age of just sucking up and absorbing it at that stage. And I really bought into it. And I really, I think it's a powerful lens. Um, uh, I, I tend to look at it the, you know, using a phrase that uh, you know, Richard Hackman coined, talked about bracketing, so that he argues that whenever you're, you're interested in some phenomenon, I don't care if you're talking about organizational competitive advantage, if you're talking about teams, if you're talking about a leader's behavior, if you're talking about individual affect, that you can bracket it and not only look at the influences from that level, but, but, but then consider, well, what is it about the context? What is it about a higher level that's impacting down, it's having a downward influence on whatever the phenomenon is that we're looking at. What is it that's coming up from below? Is it intra-individual differences? Is it team composition? Is it organizational structure? And I think that's a very powerful lens to, to take theoretically. So I think that, um, you know, we got off to a good theoretical start in the first couple of decades. That takes us to the early aughts. Uh, and then, you know, uh, no, no, uh, blame to karma, but I think we get enamored by the statistics at times. Okay. And we've gotten very, oh yeah, we've gotten very sophisticated at RCM analyses and mixed longitudinal nested kinds of analyses. And they really can be revealing, but they can also be mesmerizing in that people get enamored by the stats and lose sight of the theory. You know, what is it that we're trying to explain? So I think there's a place for the, you really need to have a theory guiding why you use particular measurement techniques, modeling techniques, sampling kinds of techniques. Again, I'm previewing what my longer talk will be. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's that theory that's guiding it all. And one other comment on that is that, and I, I'm certainly the most guilty party of all, uh, we tend to look at close cousins. Uh, we tend to say, okay, if this is my focal phenomenon and I'm looking at the team, well, what's the next layer out? Maybe it's the unit or the leader or what's maybe the next layer down? Maybe it's individual composition things. But uh, the real essence of uh, the multi-level kind of phenomenon is to start looking at larger kinds of things. What is it about organizational co uh, context? What is it about environmental features, uh, more distal influences that maybe shape a much bigger panorama of what we're looking at and how does that then change what our sampling frame should be and how we should be measuring things. Uh, so yeah. I think that, you know, those brackets, I think that's a great conceptual lens, but I think we ought to expand them a little bit and get a little bit further away. And that's where you start to pick up the multidisciplinary kinds of insights as well. Yeah. Yeah. I share all your, the same views about the, the dominant role of sophisticated analysis. And I think what is, to me, what's missing in the middle, the theory kind of can emerge from questions. And to me, the real power of these advanced tools is they allow us to ask different types of questions. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm not sure that we are fully capturing the power of those tools and are asking those types of advanced questions. So uh, that that's great. I really that really resonates with me. The other thing, you know, you mentioned being in in the trenches for so long. Um, it's hard to resist asking you a question about uh, the publishing ecosystems that we exist in today. It certainly changed a lot since when you and I got started with it. So what are some good things that you see? What are some bad things that you see? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, and things have evolved over time, but in many respects, they remain the same. Sometimes you start getting, um, you know, um, you know, the fad, you know, whether it was SEM in the day, or whether it's now ESM kinds of things, or other uh, multi-level kinds of frameworks. So we get a bit faddish, but we also learn what we can see in terms of insights on on things. Um, I think I think overall we're in a pretty good place. I know there's some issues about transparency and replication, and I'm all for that. I think that there needs to be a balance. I do an awful lot of applied work where. Um, mm -hmm. Just in terms of sharing data, if I've got you know patient recovery data, uh, uh, that's not going to be publicly available. 
uh, it's available for scrutiny if somebody questions a method, but not necessarily all data should be fully, you know, um, available to everyone. There are there are some proprietary kinds of things that we ought to think about, but we can navigate those sorts of things. Um, I think that uh, questions about generalizability are out there in terms of how stable our results, but I think those are also a byproduct of uh, the zeal for theory that we pushed at about 10 years ago. I'm all for theory. Theory has to guide what you're doing, but it's not an end state. I wrote a, a, a bit of a rant in JOB about five years ago, um, talking about the fact that theory is not the end state. Theory should be guiding the work and we should be informing theory, but just an advancement of theory in and of itself to me is not the reason that we ought to be doing what we're doing. We're in applied science, whether it's IO psych, whether it's management, whether it's applied social. Um, and we're trying to, you know, address real world kinds of concerns. So, um, you know, personally, I've had some pushback trying to do field based experiments where we actually try to move something. You know, uh, uh -huh. there's some team intervention or there's some leadership coaching or there's uh, a virtual team manipulation, things of that sort. Where we're actually trying to introduce interventions and getting pushback from reviewers uh, who ask the question, why wouldn't you think this should work? You know, isn't uh -huh. it obvious that this should work? You know, what's counterintuitive about this? And it's like, my God, you know, we've been looking at correlational relationships on this thing for a, you know, a decade, you know, can we actually move the needle? Can we actually do something to impact this? And can we test that? And um, curiously, you oftentimes get pushback trying to do field experiments, which yeah. is completely bizarre to my mind, in my mind. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, um, mm -hmm. last question then. I think you kind of <laughs> talked a little bit about what you're gonna be uh, previewing your webcast. <laughs> Again, that's coming up in a couple of weeks, October the 7th. Um, can you just review for us again what you're going to be talking about? Sure, yeah, sure. Um, uh, first, uh, I'm going to present a, a quickly sort of an integrated view of the whole research enterprise, which you know encompasses sampling, design, measurement, analysis, wrapped around theory. Uh, I can't help myself. I'll talk about some temporal issues and multi-level issues while I'm there, but that's really sort of setting the foundation for how we want to think comprehensively about addressing some question and why that should suggest certain types of research um, you know, profiles in terms of how we'd use things. Um, but then I'm going to spend the bulk of the, uh, the message really talking about multi-methods and mixed methods. I'll make a distinction between them. Multiple methods usually are converging on the same sort of thing, uh, and they come in different shapes and, and forms, whereas mixed methods are typically using different co combinations of different research strategies. So that may be a distinction that I'll make that's not you know, all that common out there. And then I'll talk about different varieties of those and how you mix and match these different techniques for different purposes. Um, so uh, I won't, I'll give away the end here, but uh, that's great. where I'm going to go when we talk. I'm going to talk. <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, we will uh, very much look forward to that and really appreciate you sharing your views with us on these topics as you did today. Uh, I mentioned this when we were chatting offline, but I forgot to mention at the introduction that uh, we can celebrate your re being recognized as the Research Methods Division's Distinguished Career Contributions Award winner. Uh, that's a great honor that you've received that's much deserved, and it will be very grateful to have your webcast contribution. So thanks for sharing this today. Uh, and if you're interested in more information about Karma and uh, John's webcast and our short courses and all that we do, just visit us at the Karma website. Uh, thanks so much, John. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. My pleasure. I look forward to it.